Michael, since this is your bag, did the president move the needle forward in any way after his Oval Office address last night when it comes to ending the shutdown? Uh, I don't necessarily think so. I mean, you, you really have two sides that are pretty well dug in. I don't think this is a sort of real meaningful disagreement. And But I, I think for markets, really, this is more kind of evidence of the problem than the problem itself, right? So the gridlock that it is evidence of is basically telling us that the types of things that the U.S. government could have done uh, in 2019 that would have alleviated some of the pressures that markets are feeling now from policy choices in 2018, i.e. putting in some fiscal stimulus, therefore putting pressure on the Fed's dual mandate in 2019, um, those things are very unlikely to happen, right? So I wouldn't look at the government shutdown as problematic in and of itself, even though it doesn't really seem like there's a resolution coming anytime soon. It's is, more is evidence. Is there a point at which it starts to matter more for the markets? Yeah, well, our economists say that, you know, basically the, the max direct economic effect in any, or in any given week is about 0.2% off of GDP growth. It's probably quite a bit smaller than that uh, because it's a partial shutdown. So if this drags on for months, I think the answer is yes. But this is still going to be, this is emblematic of a drag on the market that's going to continue for 2019 because it's telling you that there's really no path towards any meaningful legislation like infrastructure expansion or anything like that that's going to undo some of the downsides of fiscal stimulus that we're going to feel this year. Anything, is it doing anything to shake your confidence, Jonathan? I think you're, you're still one of the biggest bulls on the street, even though you took down the original forecast. Where, where were you, 33.50? Yeah, back, I, I upped my number right about the time when the market was peaking in September, um, and then we pulled it back down. But the but still, 29.25. No, it's, it's about 14% upside or 13% upside from here, which is, is pretty bullish. No, the answer is no. I mean, what are the things we care about? Um, we care about corporate profits. We care about the Fed. And I think the big story out of Washington this year is that the Fed is going to be done with this cycle. The futures market is telling you right now that the Fed will not raise rates again. They are finished, and the next move will be a down move in 2020. That's not the Credit Suisse view. That's what's actually baked into the market. And when investors in equities realize that that is, in fact, the, the, the path that we're going to go on, I, I think that you get uh, further upside. That, along with the fact that um, the earnings are going to be not stellar, but fine. So does the data have to shift for the Fed to stop raising rates, or is that already a done deal? I, I don't think so. I mean, first of all, right now what you're seeing is the inflation data is not running away, and expectations are that the economy is going to be a little bit weaker this year and a, a weaker again next year. And I don't see, and I think the marketplace agrees, how the Fed raises rates further into a decelerating economy without an inflation problem. What about earnings? How much sort of warnings like we got from Apple is baked in at this point? It's a, it's a good point. So there's really, there's two things that are weighing on the earnings revisions, if you will. The first thing is that oil prices uh, were down a lot um, recently, and that's brought oil prices down. But you've had a nice bounce in oil, just like the stock market over the last few weeks. Um, and then Apple, the question is, is Apple an Apple problem? Or is it a contagion that we're going to see it, uh, more broadly? Right now, the market's treating it as, as, as if it's Apple-specific. I think that's probably true. But if we see it as a more broad-based economic issue or China issue, that's a different story. Right now, it's not. People are trying to draw strings between Apple and FedEx and the, the I would argue, relatively small number of pre-announcements that we've gotten this week. Is there a narrative there or no? Well, I think there is because, I think, again, 2019, you're, you're experiencing some of the downsides of policies that were created in 2018. So even though we think U.S. and China trade tensions are going to ease heading into March 2nd, some of that damage has already been done along the supply chain. Apple is a good example of that. We think you're going to see more surprises like that. So the easing of U.S.-China tensions, I think that's something that's pretty helpful for equity markets in the near term. But you're going to have this continual drag from that, plus stimulus pressuring the Fed dual mandate. This is the reason that we think markets have been hanging on Powell's every word, and that's not going to change over the course of the year. So you could have equities rally from here. It's going to be really hard to break out the same range that we were in for most of 2018. Do you, I mean, German IP yesterday was ugly. Chinese auto sales down 19 year on year. I mean, that's uh, no. I mean, listen, listen. We are, we are, and as much as I'm optimistic on things, we are seeing the global economy decelerate. I mean, if you look at U.S. earnings this quarter versus non-U.S., the non-U.S. is is really very, very weak. The U.S. will be, um, you know, probably beats something close to 18, maybe 19 percent EPS growth. So uh, pretty, pretty decent. But Carl, you raise this question 
about these pre-announcements, which are negative. Pre-announcements are always the only negative. Companies don't say, by the way, I'm telling you early that we're being, sometimes they do, yeah. but usually it's negative. The overall tone of this is extremely average. We actually track what does an average quarter look like in the mix of pre-announcements. We're, we're, we're very average. The only difference is, you know, some of the names are head, you know, are, are big names or they're larger in market cap. But short of that, there's nothing unusual. And finally, Michael, what about this idea that the Trump administration has now a lot more incentive to make a trade deal with China because of what the market has done over the last few months. Yeah. Do you buy that? And if so, is there really a Trump put in this market? Yeah, I mean, I, I buy the idea that the administration is a lot more motivated and that China is a lot more motivated. I think you could see evidence of the administration's sensitivity to markets in giving Iran oil sanction waivers last year, not confirming the G20 meeting until U.S. equity markets were down 10 percent. The narrative got a lot better when U.S. equity markets were off 20 percent from their highs. Maybe the U.S. administration felt like it could press its advantage more when equity, U.S. equities were outperforming China equities. That advantage effectively evaporated into year end. So we think they're extremely sensitive to markets, therefore a lot more motivated. I think you're going to get easier ten, or easing of tensions in the market sets, which allows you to avoid escalation of tariffs, at least for the time being.